Okay, so today's talk is brought to you by the Rural Museums Network, which is a subject specialist network that covers the whole of the UK. This is say, the first of three um, autumn winter uh, Zoom seminars, the next two ones in November and one is in December. So uh, we also do monthly tuning the CUD sessions, which is a more informal uh, session and covers a wide range of topics. So do feel free to visit the website, uh, look under the events section, and we'll put a link in the chat. So to the main event, uh, today's seminar is being given to you by Professor Neil Logan, who amongst his many other accomplishments is Chair of the Scottish mm -hmm. Rural Scottish Vernacular Building Working Group. Um, uh, sorry, it's just sort of, sort of an interruption there. Uh, Neil will be talking to us today about Scottish longhouses in a presentation called Richard Huts and Despicable Hovels, Pre-Improvement Farmhouses in Scotland. We have received a number of um, questions in advance of today, which um, you know, feel free to pop any questions in the chat and you can ask them at the end and I'll present those questions at the end too. So without further ado, over to you, Neil. So, good afternoon, everybody. Is the sound okay? Yeah? Fine. So, my, my title, Wretched Huts and Despicable Hovels, comes from late 18th century and early 19th century descriptions of pre improvement farmhouses in Scotland. Very few such farmhouses still survive. What we are more used to is, is the post improvement longhouse, as I'll show you in a moment. And my interest in such buildings was sparked by moving to the house that you see in that picture there just north of Glasgow in the parish of Baldurnock, formerly Stirlingshire, um, in, in 1981. Um, we bought it because we wanted an old house with plenty of room in it. Um, we also ended up with um, something that was getting to the point of just being standing stones and so for some years I, I have been um, restoring it and learning a lot about it and in so doing have, have um, learnt quite a lot about um, long houses and pre-improvement um, housing in Scotland generally. What we're more used to seeing in Scotland is small farmhouses, particularly in the, the western parts, the, the pastoral areas, um, run by, I'm just trying to get this to advance, um, hmm. I'll have to use the, there we are, um, is the post-improvement farmhouse. These courtyard type um, farms with, with a house in the middle or to one side and steadings either side um, were the result of a, a movement um, started in the 17th century but really um, took hold in the late 18th century, swept away the old farmhouses, built um, farmhouses separate from the living accommodation for the cattle and following the tenets of the Enlightenment were, were tended to be built in a symmetrical form. So most small farms you see nowadays in Scotland are of this sort of form or were at one time and they have just sprawled and the older sort have largely gone. Now there are some written descriptions from, from um, way back, um, but I'll first start off with where my um, title comes from, from general views of the agriculture, uh, um, from the Board of Agriculture right across the UK um, in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, surveys of agricultural standards, um, really seeing how well um, agricultural improvement was, was moving in different parts of, of Britain. And the people that wrote these um, kinds of accounts tended to be um, lo local worthies and particularly ministers who by and large were caught up in the excitement of improvement and would be absolutely scathing about old housing which the occupants of those old houses were, were actually quite happy with. So they were described as wretched huts thatched with fernal straw having two apartments only well, perhaps people were happy with that. Um, 
another example um, from the early 19th century says that 50 years ago, the farmhouses in the county of Ayr were despicable hovels. And indeed, they probably looked something like this, um, built with turf or mud walls on top of stone footings and with a thatch of whatever came to hand, in this case, heather, um, but it might be straw, bracken or reed, and with a turf um, roof ridge. And a single entrance only, shared by animals and humans. In this example, um, the downhill end towards us would have been where the animals went so that the drainage channel could drain out the end wall and there would be no window or at best a really small aperture which could be um, blocked with, with stuffed up clothes or, or whatever um, if the wind is blowing from the wrong quarter. And the smoke would just find its way out through the roof or through the top of the door. And this was not just something in the Highlands, this was right across Scotland. And indeed, buildings of this sort, though perhaps a bit more sophisticated, but nonetheless the same sort of format, were widespread, particularly across the pastoral and upland areas of the British Isles generally. So as this um, expert on the architecture of Scotland from, from um, the, the Royal Commission of the Ancient Historic Monuments of Scotland from years ago said, there is no doubt that these longhouses were formerly widely distributed about Scotland and typically of this form both in lowland and highland areas. So what do I mean by a longhouse? Well here's a, a standing example that actually probably dates from the 19th century um, in Perthshire and as we, we look at that building, this is in the care of the National Trust for Scotland, by the way, and can be visited on a couple of afternoons a week. We can see the, the porch leading into the house proper. The porch would not have been an original feature and the place originally would have been thatched. The um, corrugated iron over the top um, is a protection of the thatch. The thatch is still underlying it. And the Window to the left of the doorway is the kitchen window and you'd have entered into the building proper um, into probably a service area, turned left into the kitchen as we shall see in a moment and then you could actually pass from the kitchen on down to the left hand end, the lower end of the house, which is the buyer. Now in this later example um, there are two doors, one for humans and one for animals, but the original examples, um, early examples, there had been one shared door. Notice that the window to the, to the um, kitchen is really quite small and the window to the other side of the door is quite large. That uh, now gives on to what was an enhanced parlour which has been given a gable chimney but originally that had just been the one chimney, the, the, the one that you see sticking up in, in, um, towards the middle of the roof there and, and a much simpler arrangement than the, than the masonry one you can see at the far end. So you'd go in that front door, turn left, and you'd find your way through a doorway, which we see on the right here, into the kitchen, and this hanging lum fireplace, um, which is um, a dicing with death kind of fireplace, because that fire hood is of wood um, covered with paper. But when you're not burning coals, but burning peat, um, these actually did not tend to, to burn down very regularly. So this is um, what I'm describing as, as, a, as a longhouse but also known in Scotland as a buyer dwelling. Um, this is Morlanic longhouse at Killin. So the features of a Scottish longhouse are as follows. It was a linear range of buildings under one roof, so a long house. Um, originally a shared entrance for humans and animals or at least direct internal access between the dwelling and the buyer and sometimes a cross passage but often not for both animals and humans to use. The English definition of a longhouse that's quite widely applied is that there must be a cross passage there. If there's not a cross passage it's not a longhouse but I would not apply that to Scotland. The key thing about longhouse is that it's long and that humans and animals um, shared accommodation. 
Excuse me one moment, I've got a dog biting at the door. Hopefully they'll be quiet now, they're with me. So here are some um, very early examples, archaeological evidence of longhouses. So um, the archaeological evidence shows that there was a human and an animal part of the house. Um, the first one is Pitcarmic um, in Perthshire. This is Pictish, so it's a late Iron Age kind of period. Um, Jarlshof and Hamar in Shetland. These are both Viking. Kintor in Perthshire, this is medieval. Lenoka in Lanarkshire, this is 17th century. And Kamsani in Perthshire, which is still standing. Um, how far back it goes, I don't know, but the present building is 18th century. Here are some early written accounts. Uh, the, the first one from a sailor in Martin Frobisher's um, crew, um, looking for the Northwest Passage in, um, that stopped in, uh, uh, in Orkney on their way to, to the Northwest in 1577. And his account um, is a bit of a cheek really, ending with the words very beastly and rudely in respect of civility, because this kind of house was quite widespread right across the British Isles. Um, Presumably he'd just never seen one if, if he was a sailor and just, just um, came, came from the coast. And then a soldier from um, Cromwell's army in 1650 um, spoke of noisome smells, but again, such houses would have been commonplace across the British Isles. And a soldier in the um, English army following the um, Battle of Culloden um, also describes a longhouse. Where, where he was in Scotland when he, he um, spoke of that, I don't know. Going back to one of those general view accounts, um, as I say, they are often scathing. Um, speaking of the, uh, the, the fire serving the double purpose of concealing every disgusting object in the wreaths of smoke and, and affording a constant supply of varnish for the woodwork. Two windows, each containing only one pane, or at least, uh, but I can't quite see what I've written at the top here because I've got some, I've got Zoom stuff overlying it. Um, or at the most, two of which are provided with glass, serve to render the internal darkness visible. This this is a window at Orkindrain, um, Argyle, where, where um, Sharon is based. However, there are some more positive accounts, such as this one by Dorothy Wordsworth visiting um, the ferryman's house on Loch Catrin in the Trossachs in 1803, even though it was only written up in 1874 and published. This is the first genuine Highland hut we had been in, and we entered by the cow house, the house door being within at right angles to the outer door, so that, that's an important point. I sat down in the chimney corner of her smoky building. Smoke came in gusts and the beams and rafters gleaming between the clouds of smoke. They had been crossed over and varnished by many winters, just as in the previous, um, previous description I, I gave, but with a more positive spin this time. And she talked about the cow house being at the other side of the wall. And she thought she'd seldom heard a sweeter fireside sound than that of the housewife milking the cow behind the chimney at breakfast time. So enough about opinions, um, something now about construction. So as I've already mentioned, old buildings were in general formed of clay tempered with um, on, on stone footings. Um, this clay was tempered with, with chopped straw. Um, this may be in the form of um, mud bricks or in, in mass walling with shuttering. And the timbers were carried down to the bottom of the clay wall. That, that's to say they were crux timbers, which I'll say more about in a little while. But again, this, um, this account uh, could not help itself from being scathing because it concludes that if the thatch is not well maintained, um, 
the materials of these old buildings form a valuable addition to the compost heap. So a little about the, the wall construction, then we'll build ourselves upwards. Here are the footings of that 17th century um, longhouse in Lanarkshire that I showed you earlier. And the, the notches in the wall that you can see in the further wall there are from where the cruts stood. This would have been built up with um, turf or clay, just as you see in this picture from the Highland Folk Museum in Newton Moor. And it, it's a point worth making that the, the footings that one sees of ruined houses right around Scotland were footings. It's not that somebody's sawn off the building above it and taken the stones away. There were stone footings. Then on top of that, there was often mud walling and that has just weathered away, leaving the footings as we see them now. So that's why these lower walls always seem to come up to about the same height in so many ruins. The building there on the right is, is thatched with heather. Um, here is a mass clay walled building um, still surviving, Prize Lynn Bothy in the debatable land um, down near the border with Cumbria. And I'll say for more about the, this kind of walling in a moment. But again, you can see there are stone footings at the bottom there and the mass clay walling on top. And here's another building at the Highland Folk Museum, just to show that there's a different thatch here. This is bracken and other things could be used for walling um, and partition, such as the, the wicker work we, we see on the left there. So the mud walling is um, really very straightforward. We see two of the components here, a wheelbarrow full of subsoil, clay subsoil, and a hose pipe to provide the water. All you would then do is mix in a little straw to temper it, and you would make clay bricks rather like this. And the chap that was running the workshop and producing these that I attended um, some years ago is standing in, in, the, in the top top right picture with, with the Czech shirt on. And that is his trade. He is a mud builder and thatcher. Incidentally, Robert Burns' cottage in Alloway in Ayrshire, um, which exists still as a tourist attraction, but is actually a facsimile, Victorian facsimile of the original um, building, that was built and is now also built in clay. And indeed, when um, Burns was a baby in arms, the building that um, his father had built with some friends was, was storm damaged and the gable end fell away. And Burns' mother had to escape the building with him as a baby in arms. Now I bring us round to where I'm sitting right now. The room I'm sitting in was the stable of, of a long house. And the, um, the doorway you can see behind me um, in the picture of me is the near aperture in the wall in, in the picture on the left there right now. It's, it's a later aperture made, I think, in the 1960s. It's certainly not original. But the key thing to note here is the batter to the walls and the footings sticking out, suggesting that this was originally a turf wall building with broad stone footings and walls up to perhaps three feet thick. Not only that, but you see on the right there, there's um, a lowish wall, um, about three, three, four foot high in places, um, from the hillside behind the house. And originally this alleyway, alleyway wouldn't have existed. Um, there would have been the, the, the hillside coming right down and abutting against the back of the house. And so the, the um, the hillside had actually had a terrace cut into it to make a place, a platform for the house to sit on. And indeed, I have calculated that the amount of topsoil um, once taken away would leave enough um, subsoil in this platform for them to have produced enough walling to build the original shape house that I believe to have been here um, for two foot thick or so and, and five foot high walls. Viewed from the other end of the alleyway, we see these huge stones that um, certainly belong to a, a former building um, rather than the stone and lime constructed one we have now. And indeed, when I first moved here, I was 
tidying up the pointing of these stones, I discover they're not actually bonded with lime mortar at all. They're bonded with, with mud. And originally that house would have had just two windows or possibly only one out back. Um, the one you can see um, just above the boulders there and, and the one where you see us further down the alleyway, the stone sticking out, that, that is the kitchen window, just at the end of where, the, where, where you see the hose pipe running. There. Now inside the house that the, the um, roof timbers, the, the, the crux I refer to, often crux in England and particularly Wales were very elegant, um, paired blades of timber cut from a single trunk, curved trunk and often beautifully decorated. In Scotland they tend to be whatever came to hand and cobbled together because timber was scarce and expensive. Something particularly to notice in this example is the two horizontal timbers um, called collar beams that stabilize the, the crux um, and they are pinned, they, they are trenched on their backsides and lap onto the, the, the crux and are pegged to them and, and the reason for me mentioning that you'll, you'll see um, in a little while. Here are some details of um, other um, crux roofs. This is at Orkin Drain where, where you can see a lot of smoke blackening and any old piece of wood will serve as, as, um, as crux, purlins and, and, and um, rafters. The Borlanic longhouse that we saw earlier is a bit more elegant and lofty but this is a restoration by the National Trust for Scotland. And over the kitchen area at Morlanic, one can see again examples of smoke blackening and whatever timber comes to hand for the purlins and the rafters. Now this little building at Orkin Drain is thatched in that picture or being thatched in that picture with, with rush which doesn't last very long. And that building is um, currently um, nearing the end of re-thatching with um, heather, which is much, much better. Um, thatching material can last up to 25 years. But thatching, as I've already said, whatever material can come to hand. So enough of construction, and now something about the plan form. This is something that, um, led me to understand the, the nature of this building, or believe I could understand the nature of this building, um, some years back. In later longhouses, there might be a partition wall. This might be something as similar, uh, uh, sorry, as simple as, as um, wood boards or um, wickerwork, or it might be something more substantial made of stone. And the fire might migrate from the centre of the floor um, to, to the wall, so that the wall became a, a fire back, perhaps with a hanging lumber on it. In the areas of Scotland that were still burning peat, you did not really want a good updraft um, from a fire back, big fire back um, and flue because it would burn the peat too fast. So they would often keep the fire in the centre of the floor, perhaps against a rudimentary fire back, and might form a partition um, with box beds. So this um, this design with, with with the partition onto the cross passage, or or um, in the case of buildings without a cross passage, onto the common entrance for the animals and humans, um, is known as the hearth backing on entry plan. And here are a couple of examples. This one from near Stirling, um, from a sketch drawn in the 1850s of, of um, a house called Fisher Row, um, uh, a late survival of, of some simple cottages. And hopefully you can see from, from the doorway by which the person is standing that once you allow for perspective, the chimney is off to the left of that. So the, the person will go in that doorway turn left into the kitchen lit by that little window and the path must be backing onto the entry there. Here is another example, a sketch from 1792 um, entitled um, 
inside a moss house. Because this house, believe it or not, had been carved out of solid peat when peatlands were being leveled and drained. So the inside of the house was dug out and the um, peat was left for walls and then the surrounding area was dug away, leaving walls of peat standing and then the cruck roof was, was added to it. And we can see in this particular example that there is a fire back rather than a, a proper um, substantial stone um, partition, but of course they didn't have stone there, they had peat, and this is just looks like wood boards, but you can see very clearly that um, first we're coming that doorway on the right and turn right into the byre or left into the kitchen that we see in front of us. And here is a photograph from the late 19th century from Glen Dockert, which is the area where the Morlanic Longhouse is, and we once again see very clearly an example of kitchen with um, path backing onto the entry and a small kitchen window. Um, the former buyer, possibly the present buyer, um, at the lower end of the building. Um, other outhouses have been built later on. And at the near end of the building, mezzanine loft area has been created with a little window and the dispense or parlour has been enhanced by having a gable fireplace built in masonry whereas the original fireplace is um, made with, with a pot that has got the patch built up around it. Here's an example of a longhouse at Orkindrain, which was occupied until, as a longhouse until 1954. Originally, this building um, did not have that entrance into the house part separately, in all likelihood. One entered through the byre, turned left to gain access to the kitchen, and the closet and spence areas may well be um, extension of the of the building, making it longer than it originally was. The closet area um, would have been the um, service area, um, particularly for, for a, a dairy farm, and um, that's where the dairying would have gone on, and that's exactly what the service area and dairy in my present house is like as well, I, um, although larger, as I'll show you later on. Another couple of examples of, of longhouses. One, this one, um, not very far from where I live, this is in Stirlingshire, it's about 10-15 um, oh, miles away from here, demolished now. Um, not a typical longhouse in that the cross passage gives onto the kitchen, but the buyer is at the other end of the house. So animals and humans would never have had a shared entrance here. But this does have the hearth backing onto the entry. And when this was demolished, let the clock shut up. When this house was demolished, its crux timbers were saved, and um, that, that's just before demolition and they were re-erected in the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh as a feature of the um, display, that's a permanent display feature there. Finally, uh, another one that's not very far from here, about some um, 15, 20 miles away. Although when surveyed in the 1950s, the, the kitchen and inner room had gone, a man who um, used to live there, remembers how it was, was able to describe what we see here in the form of peck lines. And again, we can see um, not necessarily a cross passage, it may not have been open at the far side of the passage, but path back onto the entry and on the other end of the building, the buyer. And this one had a lintel dated um, 1702, but it's believed given that the, the buyer wall is very thick indeed, that it may date from the late 17th century. So that leads me up to a description of the place that I'm sitting in now so that I can go through it chamber by chamber and show how it was constructed and how it was operated. So my house is Akedike there near the little village of Balmore in a small parish called Baldurnock just north of Glasgow. Um, as you can see from the inset map at, at your top right. 
But that is the house nowadays. The um, part of the house with the, in, in, the, in the white building nearest us, with the two nearest windows, are late 20th century additions. The upper part of the main house with the blue dormer windows there um, is late 19th century. So originally the whole range was single story. And the porch down at the far end in what was formerly the buyer is also a late 20th century addition. Now this house um, has a fairly checkered history in my time here. We, we moved here in um, 1981 and then after 13 years of painstaking restoration on a shoestring budget, but well, actually uh, these, it's not a shoestring budget, these were Thatcher years and I was an academic, so actually a zero budget. We were flooded and 13 years of restoration was wiped out and we had a six month re-restoration period, but um, financed by an insurance claim. In 1996, after that, one of the cottages, the, the, the one with the red door there, formerly the stable where I'm sitting now, um, the, the occupant didn't want to face another flood, so moved out. So we, we bought it from them and moved into it. So there we see the kitchen area immediately after the flood. That's after stripping out to a mud floor, and it was the original mud floor underneath a suspended wood floor. And the bricked up area is where the fireplace was, what had been bricked up in the 1960s. Um, here it is undergoing um, restoration with, with, a, with a Rayburn stove in there and the fireplace restored, and we ended up with that. And I'll come back to this image in, to, to show a bit, bit, bit more detail later on. From a postcard in 1905, we can see the building um, still operating as a farm with a sliding door for the buyer. Single windows um, downstairs for the, for the kitchen and, and parlour, and the nearest um, little cottage, just two windows in the doorway. And the main road running straight past the middle of the front of the house, um, and the rest being open fields. And this is a, a rather naive um, watercolour painting of a few years beforehand, where we see much the same arrangement. What we can also see here is the um, ridging of ploughing in the hill behind the house, and then running um, a slant across the, the brow of the hill, the dike, the head dike that kept the animals on one side, up above grazing, and the crops safe down below, known as a, as a head dike, and that is where the name of the place comes from, from the dike. So I'll go through these building, um, the, these chambers of the building one by one. We needn't worry ourselves with, with the upper half story, that's of no interest to us now, and I'll work from the hay, hay barn along. Since I um, did this diagram, I have discovered by a study inside the hay barn chamber that it is not an original part of the building, but has been stuck on the end and is not bonded to the rest of the range. So that's why that pecked blue line is running through there. It's a later addition. Then we come to the spence or, or lounge and the kitchen service area, which has been split up into um, storage and, and bathroom shower room. Stable that's been split up into this study area where I'm sitting now and, and a bedroom and a bar which was turned into a separate cottage. If we strip out all of that detail, we come back to the place as it probably was at the end of the 18th century with just a single window or an aperture out the back that the kitchen window lights in the fireplace. And with, although no access between the house and the buyer, certainly access between the house and the stable. So it still qualifies as a longhouse. Humans and animals have internal access to each other. It's also worth noting from this um, um, diagram that the, the doorway into the service area is narrower than that into the stable, um, 
probably so that animals couldn't get in through the front door. It was just a wee bit too narrow for them. So this might ask an impression of how it probably looked at the time. Um, with very small windows, no window at all to the buyer, um, a thatched roof, thatched with whatever came to hand, turf ridging, and a mucking out hole down at the, the near end, the buyer. Um, cattle grazing on the high ground um, on the top of the hill behind the house, and the head dike that I mentioned earlier running across um, above the, the golden crops there. This <clears throat> place is marked in a military survey made following the Jacobite Rebellion. Um, this was made in 1752, this area, and the house is marked. The arrangement of buildings is wrong, but these were just conventional markings that the map maker used. It amuses me that um, it's been misspelt here as agar dyke, given that I was a bacteriologist and agar is what we grew our bacterial cultures on. So if we start at the hay barn end and work our way down, we can see from a few shots that I managed to snatch um, when the place was being refurbished in the 1980s, we can see these stone pillars and then openings between them which is a bit of a giveaway of it being an open fronted building. And the wall behind that leaning white dirty door there was recently cleaned up by the occupants. And although it might seem like um, an artifact of the lighting, the quality of the stonework below the, the margin between the light and dark there, the light, the light and shadow is of a much, much higher standard than that above it. And this relates to when the top of that wall was um, rebuilt to provide a fireplace upstairs for the, for the new bedroom that went on in the late 19th century. The lower part is, I think, beautifully built. Essentially, they built a wall in dry stone and then pointed it with lime mortar rather than just using lime mortar bedding. So these walls are exceptionally stable and, and beautifully preserved. A hay barn of this sort is visible in a 19th century engraving of one of Robert Burns' farms in Ayrshire. We can see just such a, a building with just, just um, one pillar in the middle above the two brightly coloured um, figures in the foreground there. On into the Spence or parlour. Um, the key thing to note in, in this um, view is the use of a piece of old timber forming the lintel above the door, door there. To the right of where the photographer is standing for that image, on the front wall of the house, below the window, we see there's a pronounced batter in the wall. The wall here is about three foot thick, um, heavy stone footings. This, this was um, photographed during, during the refurbishment after the flood. This house, um, sorry, this room almost certainly would have contained box beds. It would have been part of the sleeping accommodation for the house. Um, Morlanic has just such a box bed, um, uh, just adjacent to the kitchen area. And both rooms um, sport cruisy lamps or cresset lamps. Um, in Morlanic, they're for real lighting. In the case of my lounge, just there for decoration. But I have actually um, used one of these lamps that the upper part holds the wick and the oil, the lower part catches the drips and they, they burn quite well using a, a, a wick of um, rush piss. They burn quite brightly but they don't burn for very long at all. On the other side of that doorway we see another piece of timber. This is both all the timber in this doorway, um, lintel fabrication is Scots pine. When I exposed this in the 1980s, it had been covered up with many layers of chipboard and, uh, and, um, and plasterboard. It was filthy and I brushed it clean and uh, the dirt that came off quite clearly from its smell was, was peat soot. Something that was exposed at the time of the flood was that niche above where the chair is and as this backs onto the hearth, in the, the, the lounge area, I'm pretty sure this is an original feature as a dry place where um, 
the Bible and salt and other things, um, such things could be stored. And on the, the right, you can just see the corner of, of a lowland dresser, absolutely typical of, of a house like this, um, that the, the top surface of the dresser would not be used for ornament, but be used as a board for doing um, baking preparation on. Swinging round through 180 degrees, we see the, the view of the kitchen that I showed earlier. And the things to note here are above the dresser there, or cupboard, um, and the display of china, and above the doorway, are two more bolts of timber. That above the china is beech, still with bark attached to it, a former cruck timber, and that above the doorway is oak. This room too would have had box beds in it, just like this example at Orkindrain, complete there with its dresser, but with some superstructure added to it in this case. Now, a particularly interesting feature of the kitchen window area, the back window, quite apart from its oak lintel there with a, with a peg hole in the left hand end, is just outside the window when replacing this window, because when we moved here, the, the window was in a desperate state. I had to build a new one. When I was fitting this, I found the outer half of a stone sink surviving in the wall. I should imagine this is not so much a washing up sink as a slopping out kind of sink. And the sink area set in, in a wall, um, set right, right into the window, um, so that the, the wall is actually quite narrow under the window itself, so you could stand in the window embrasure. Um, we see also in this example at Orkindrain. Moving on into the dairy, now looking at the back side of, of the front door with um, its lintel, which is a slab of elm, we can see really, really rough coins forming the, the sides of the opening there. Some of them rather blackened, probably from soot because they were formerly around the fireplace. If we swing around to our right, we can look at the doorway into the kitchen, also with timbers over it, as we saw before. and the back side of that dresser with the display of china that we saw in the kitchen was actually created by building up a doorway and then filling it immediately with masonry, which is what that, um, that area which has the picture hanging on it um, shows us. The timbers here are particularly interesting because if we look at the ones above the door into the kitchen, we can see that the nearest one has a trench cut in the back side of it, and it's got skew pegging in, in the front of it. This was a collar beam from a cruck roof. Going downhill, down steps into the dairy area, again, we see very crude walling, but we also see bolts of timber set into the wall um, for, for nailing perhaps a door frame to. And we see here that, that the longhouse at Molanic, um, with again the same kind of let these clocks shut up, with the same kind of of um, daring utensils as we saw at Orkindrain, Drain, and again the the, the dairy area um, here would have, would have would have had much the same kind of, of work being done in it a plaster walled. Um, room originally, bare walls now, um, to be clean and, and to be separate from the kitchen fire, a clean dairy preparation area. And then we come down into the stable where I'm sitting now. Now we can see here, hopefully, that the front door and the stable door um, are of different dimensions. And the stable door has actually been cut down um, in relatively recent times with a new lintel area um, above and a huge bulk of um, concrete to make a new doorstep below. The house used to be rather subject to flooding, I think that's why this was done. So the floor has been raised, but if one looks in front of that um, big doorstep at the stable and, and the flower pot on it, one can see the original um, threshold, um, which 
although you can't see it easily from that picture, it's like, like the one by the front door is rather worn through use and lies at about um, level of about a foot lower than, than the um, kitchen, uh, than the front doorway. An interesting feature inside the stable is this um, notch in the um, wall of the doorway because this, I'm convinced, was formerly a crux slot. I can see the pad stone at the bottom to receive the, the crux timber, the crux blade, and then the, the tower of stones on the left hand side there has actually been used as an infill later with some piece of wood let into it so that a, a piece of timber for whatever a partition or something for a loose box, something like that immediately inside the door could be added to it. So that is a surviving crux slot from a wall built in stone and lime. So it does seem that the place still had some crux in parts of it um, when it was rebuilt in stone and lime. There's a similar kind of arrangement at Orkin Drain. We can see a crux blade running down beside a doorway there in, in its stable. An odd place to put a crux because it's rather unstable with one side free onto the doorway rather than being encompassed on both sides by the wall but quite likely because the wall is actually a, a later addition. Sorry, the, the, the door, yeah, the door is a later addition and the, um, the crux would have originally run down into a solid wall without any um, aperture. And finally, the buyer. I don't have any pictures inside the buyer um, next door to me um, when it was being refurbished. And, um, well, let's say conservative within an inch of its life and all original features stripped out. But here is a buyer at, at Orkin Grain at the Eddie's house that I showed you earlier. This is an unusual one because the, the drainage channel and door are down at one end. Um, this is possibly a later addition um, because typically the drainage channel would have run out at the end and a mucking out hole and the door would be in, in the front. So this has a door in the front to, to, to the house and um, a, a door in the far end, which could be used for mucking out as well. The sort of houses, uh, the sort of cows in, in houses like this at this time would have probably been airshears, not, not the famous Highland coos with their horns. So this I think is that the original footprint of the place and the buyer and stable um, might, might have been one unit at that time and the, the, the bigger buyer built on later. And this I was confident until relatively recently that it was built about 1780, but I recently discovered a will um, that makes it much more likely that this was actually done in the um, 1760s. And the previous building's footprint seems to be marked by these boulder footings, mortar with mud and a strong batch to the rear wall and indeed the, the front wall. Going back, say, 150 years from this, what would houses in this area and right across Scotland have been like? What would these wretched huts and despicable holes look like? Well, I've shown you this image um, already, but I've actually got some documentary evidence that animals were living in the houses with people from this local will from a, from a farm just a couple of miles away from me from 1620, which lists in the inventory a furrow that is to say a barren cow in Margaret Bowie's house. Tidy cow, that's one with milk. And a heifer in John Ballock's house in Belmore, the adjacent village. Um, incidentally, this um, is very much on the side. This um, John Ballock or Bullock was a member of a family that were absolutely centered on this parish and more or less nowhere else in Scotland. And that family's progeny gave rise to the first governor of Georgia in the USA, um, whose um, great granddaughter married Theodore Roosevelt Jr. Their son was Theodore Roosevelt, the president. His brother um, had a daughter called Eleanor, and she married a distant cousin, um, Franklin D. Roosevelt. So from a mud hut, in Baldurnock, um, 
ultimately we led to um, two people in the White House. Now, a lot of this um, reading of, of ancient documents was started when I stumbled upon the testament of a man who lived in a house on this site in 1603. This is his will, the testament testamenta, that means uh, a, a will that he wrote while still living. And it refers to the place, Akedike of Belmore, which shows that the, the site was occupied um, probably from at least the late um, 16th century and named after its head dike. This led me into reading um, various documents, um, land transfer documents, wills, um, baptismal records, marriage records, to try to piece together all of the people that have lived in this house since 1603. Um, I've only been partly successful, as you might expect, but I did find a, a family um, headed by Henry Gibb um, that occupied the house for much of the 18th century. And I found what I originally thought was Henry Gibb um, father, Henry Gibb son and Henry Gibb grandson, married to three different women, of course, um, living here between 1715 and the 1760s. But just before lockdown, I discovered a will that made it quite clear that there was only the one Henry Gibb, who married three women, had nine children, the last of these when he was 72, which makes one shudder. And my wife seized upon this, and, and she's a keen genealogist, and living just about um, 20 miles away, she managed to find this lady, who is actually the four times great grandson of the Joseph Gibb that we see in that um, baptismal record there. And so she visited us and sat in the, the very space where her um, forebear was no doubt born, um, a matter of days before lockdown began and my researches were brought abruptly to an end. So with that, I'll thank you for your attention and end my talk and leave you with a, a chilling image. Well, thank you, Neil, for that fascinating talk. I'm sure I can thank you on behalf of the Rural Museums Network and everybody who's joined here today. We, um, we do have a few questions that came in earlier. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take one uh, of these questions, or I'll present one of these questions first, yep. and then we can throw it onto the floor if, if that's okay. Yep, sure. Um, so one of the questions is, at what point and how did the change from hovel to more substantial farmhouses take place? Um, well, the, 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 the so-called improved buildings um, were built by the landlords. So it was very much um, the, the, the landlords, the lairds, um, controlled everything. And indeed, they, they, were, um, they were subjects themselves often of um, nobility. Um, so it was, it was pretty feudal in Scotland until quite late on. The, the feudal um, landowner in this area was the Duke of Montrose. And so it was decided it was, that it was time to invest in farming so as to get better rental money coming in. And so it was at that point that the simple houses were, were destroyed money was spent on building better houses in the hope that there would be better agricultural output, very much following the tenets of the Enlightenment with separate areas for storage and feeding and, and humans not living with animal filth and so on and so forth. So that saw a huge amount of investment, which was sometimes successful in bringing in more money, but sometimes just bankrupt the landowners. Um, in this particular area, Probably it happened chiefly around the, 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 the 1780s, but so, sometime between um, 1760s and um, 1810s, that sort of period. And so the agricultural reports that I mentioned earlier um, 
tended to be late 18th century, then again um, rewrites in the early 19th century, so as to show how much, if at all, things have changed in a particular locality. Okay, thank you. I'll throw open to the floor. Does anybody want to pop their hand up and ask a question? I did see a hand going up earlier, but it's disappeared. Oh, there's Bob. Bob, do you want to put your question? Uh, Neil, you talked about the, just a moment ago, about when the transition happened. Mm -hmm. um, uh, do you connect changes in the structure of housing with the uh, changes to cultivation methods uh, with agricultural improvement? where there is an argument that the topsoil should not be stripped from the ground because it's bad from the ground. Uh, are we seeing this all happen at the same sort of time with the move to stone away from turf building and the improved agricultural methods? Well, I, 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 from my reading, I have the impression it, that um, not stripping off turf and topsoil was um, a bit of a lever um, in complaints against the old style dwellings. But generally speaking, it wasn't really true, as you know, at Orkin Drain, you know, turf dikes were recreated without destroying it as, a, as an agricultural area. Um, and if properly maintained, that the turf dikes or mud walls would last a long time. So it was used as an argument, but I'm not convinced it was a very sound argument. <laughs> and, and for example, if the topsoil from, um, sorry, the subsoil from, from the platform where my house sits was um, taken out to build mud walls, well, you know, they're not taking out any agricultural land there. They're just taking out some subsoil from the platform where the house was going to stand. Mm -hmm. um, and a properly thatched roof. I'll just let the clock be quiet. A, a, a properly thatched roof um, with with turf underneath and, and thatch on top, well maintained. You know that 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 turf can be there for many years. It's not as if it's going to be stripped off the way it was, um, say, in the Hebrides. Um, every few years once um, impregnated with peat soot and, and, and put on the ground as, as fertiliser. Um, this didn't necessarily happen in these parts, I don't think. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Uh, Bob Pebble, did you have yeah. your hand up, Bob? Yeah, sure, sure I did. Hi, Neil. Um, I was responsible for the building or destruction of some of the buildings that you showed at the uh, Folk Museum there, but one, one of the uh, conclusions I came to part of the change was the introduction of dry stone diking and some of the evidence I've seen from around up here you know sort of in and around can you see Newton Moore is that you, you have a change away from turf construction to dry stone construction once people are starting to learn these new skills and they're That's introducing that so you, you've got that stage as well as the sort of, shall we say, masonry with lime as well. Um, <clears throat> but the other thought, coming back to what Bob was saying too, um, with the house that you showed, which um, we actually pulled down because it, it, it actually wasn't working efficiently, but if you notice on your photographs that the the wall was fairly high, but in, as, as we worked more with the buildings, it was the efforts that was taken to actually cut the turf was actually substantial. So what I did was that, that building that you showed, I, I rebuilt it, I don't know, about 10 years ago, but I lowered the walls. So that meant that there was less turf dug. Yeah. It also increased the pitch of the roof. Yeah. Because one of the problems was that the water penetration ingress with the rain, so with the, with the steeper pitch working with the crux, you needed less turf to build the walls, but you had a better pitch as well to, you know, with yeah. the heather or whatever thatch to keep the buildings dry. So, you know, there's so much of it tied in with experimental archaeology as well. But um, 
it, as I say, it was a huge, huge, huge effort when we started to try digging turf by hand. And then, of course, we went on to using turf machines, which, of course, nobody had back in the 1700s or whatever. Yeah. Well, th thank you for that. I, I find, find that um, re really interesting and helpful and, and informative. Um, of course, uh, with, with stone, it's also a matter of how much stone is available um, locally. And I have noticed, uh, say, in the Trossachs, um, some, some houses that were built with mud mortar um, or clay mortar, which has weathered out. And the buildings are still standing to quite a decent height, particularly their gables. They are so well built. They are essentially dry stone walls that have been pointed with clay or mud rather than um, actually bedded in, in, in mud mortar. And, and as you say, um, following the acquisition of um, the skills, the dry stone walling skills, that, that is an angle that I hadn't really thought about previously, but, but I think it's, it's a very, um, very, very credible one indeed, yes. Well, I, I, one of my last houses that I built at the museum, I've been retired eight years now, are based on a photograph that was taken um, this is sort of like a Washington Wilson style photograph, but it's not. And so of a house of Granton and Spey. And it's, I mean, it's it's three foot thick um, dry stone walls. Well, that's why I interpret it because about, oh, I don't know, 10 miles from here, there is actually a, a well-established longhouse, mm. but it's actually next to uh, other township buildings. And there is actually the remains of a house as we rebuilt it with dry stone walls that are actually, they are about three foot thick. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, there's, you know, good photographic evidence and good physical evidence still there. Um, and so, you know, got the lads at the museum to build it. And uh, I mean, it, it's um, with, um, uh, we put crux slots into that one as well. So, so you've got the, the slots given extra, you know, the crack given extra strength to the dry stone construction as well. But, um, I mean, I really do see that as an intermediary sort of stage. And, and yet the, the, I, my perception is that the, the transition from mass stone walling that could support A-frames to the point where cracks were dispensed with was, was um, a rather long one. They went on losing using crux long after they actually needed crux well, because they had stout walls to support the roof. Yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah, I and, mean and, there were there were there were cru crux around here associated with much much later buildings. Yeah, you know, a building similar to what uh, Bob has got down at Rock and Drain. You know, yeah. and something else you mentioned about the lowness of the walls also very much um, chimes with some some of the things I've read about early travellers to Scotland saying that to get into the houses you, you may have to more or less shoulder um, the thatch up out of the way uh, to duck your way in. Well that, that was one of the another reason that I did it so that um, although the buildings were primarily south facing so you're maximizing on the heat from the sun yeah. you know in the, in the winter time as well you know you, you've got sort of the blast from the wind and the weather going in as well but it, also the other reason too was that if you have a steeper pitch on the roof, you, you, as soon as you're in, you're you're at, at head height. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's, so it's, it's not like you know we reconstructed the black house at the museum, which the Lewis type one, where I mean you really have to duck to go the whole way under. But yeah. with the with the crook frame, you're you're near enough straight into sort of good headroom. But yeah. you, you've got, as I say, a smaller aperture for helping keep keep the weather out. Yeah. And of course, still, still will be tall enough to let the cattle through because, I mean, that's the other thing which a lot of people never take into consideration that, you know, livestock were, on the whole were much smaller. Um, and so, you know, so it work, works fairly well. I, I read once of a, an account of Bonnie Prince Charlie being um, entertained in one of these houses and he was granted a, a throne like chair as everybody else just squatted on the floor or, or on low stools. So he kept on having to go outside to, to clear his eyes from the peat reek, <laughs> whilst everybody else was below the level of the smoke, which was finding its way out through the door. Yeah, I, could, I, I, could, I can well believe that. <laughs> okay, well, so th thanks for that. So we've got, are you okay to do a couple more yeah, questions? Sure, sure. Yep, yep. Um, 
from Trista Elliot, I hope you've a pronounce your name okay there. Um, the earth and straw bricks sound like Adobe and the American Southwest. Did such bricks in Scotland get dried to that degree? And if so, how did they do it? Well, they, they, they wouldn't and couldn't have been sun baked. Once, once dry, um, touch dry, they were strong enough to build with. And the key thing then was to give them a, a, a decent um, thatch cover to keep them dry. Um, as, a, as I think it was a cob builder um, in Devon said, um, you, you treat your cob building like a baby, um, you give it a good hat and a dry bottom and it's happy. Um, so what if you have one of these um, mud brick or mass wall um, mud wall buildings just so long as it's kept dry just as the the early the, the, the late 19th century um, example I gave earlier when they said if the um, if you didn't look after the thatch the, the, the walls rot in the season that was a key thing look after the thatch and the walls will survive but they're, they're not baked in any way the way they would be in the sunshine of, of um, other warmer parts of the world at all, no. Okay, um, we've got a question from Agav. I don't know, Agav, do you want to um, come in and ask it yourself? Are you able to do that? Hello. Oh. Hello. If, if, if that's the easiest thing. I, I was just wondering if there's any rule for understanding the geographical distribution of longhouses as opposed to black houses. Something I've always wanted to know, but keep forgetting to ask those in the know. Well, the sort of the, the Hebridean black house um, is very much Hebridean. Um, they weren't really found outside the Hebrides. And a lot of the older um, type houses found on the mainland um, might be called black houses, but they're not sort of technically speaking proper Hebridean black houses. And it seems to be that um, the older style houses on the mainland were called black houses because the newer houses, um, the post improvement houses, which tend to be whitewashed, were white. Whereas the older houses were, were smoke blackened and dark. And so that's where the name black house comes from. Um, that, that is one suggestion. And it is perhaps worth mentioning that when um, Dorothy Wordsworth was visiting houses on the Solway Firth, um, she said the old style mud houses were really cosy and warm in winter and cool in summer and people liked living in them, whereas the new so-called white houses um, were often ra rather scruffy, they were uncomfortable to live in, they were not well insulated and people didn't like them at all. Thank you, man. Okay, a couple more from the, I think these are um, actually, I have in the chat, uh, George Munger gave you a, a quick point as well about, about that question. All right, thank you. Yeah. Um, we've got somebody asking, have you any information on farmhouse? I, I think these questions are more looking for resources yeah. um, because I've got one saying, um, is it possible to obtain some early drawings of specific farmhouses? Uh, they have an Ainsley drawing of one at Eaglesome. Um, but where the, these don't even anywhere else. And again, have you any information on farmhouses in Ayrshire? Um, as regards drawings, no. I'm not saying there aren't any, it's just I don't know of any. But for the descriptions, such as I drew on earlier in my talk, um, the, the agricultural surveys are well worth looking at. And some of these are available online. Um, so that's a good starting point to find good descriptions. So, so some of my diagrams and diagrams that I've used um, for publications outside this talk are based very much on um, interpreting these descriptions and doing drawings a accordingly, do do doing my planned drawings accordingly. As regards pictures of actual standing buildings, um, they seem to be very, very few and far between. I mean, the, 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 the um, 
the examples I gave in my talk of the Fisher Row and the, the Turf House in um, Stirling, um, Stirlingshire. I, I showed those to a great extent because there, there weren't any other examples to, to find anyway. I didn't just show those because they were local, because they are about the only pictures available. I think there's still a lot of work to be done in research though as well. I mean, perhaps something okay. that isn't. Nearly all gone before photography. And it's only when um, the sort of romantic movement took off, people like Dorothy Wordsworth, that such places were seen as attractive and worth recording. Hmm? Yeah. By which time an awful lot of them had gone and been replaced by, by improved houses. So even for the romantic movement, there weren't necessarily very many examples left for them to draw or paint. Yeah, so can you point um, uh, the, this questioner about information on farmhouses in Ayrshire? Are there any resources for that, that you know of? Well, as I, as I said, the, um, the, the, um, uh, uh, the, the general survey of the agriculture of Ayrshire, um, that, that, um, that, that, that I quoted early on, um, let me see if I can find that um, slide again. Um, um, can't quite remember where it was, so I just, it was earlier than that, wasn't it? There we are, Aiton, um, yeah. William Aiton in 1811, a general view of the agriculture of the county of Eyre. Um, the earlier account, the late <clears throat> 18th century one, is nothing like as detailed um, as Aiton's account, but Aiton gives a very good account of the, the construction and the plan form and the way in which these places were used. It, that, that is one of the best accounts there is. So that, that would be my first go-to, find Aiton's general view of the agriculture of the County of Eyre. Great, and thanks to Bob Powell for putting that note in about Alexander Fenton and Bruce Walker's book. Uh, that would be helpful as well. So rural, I've got... Yes, the rural, uh, yep. Fenton and Walker's The Rural Architecture of Scotland um, book. Um, uses these general views heavily and so carries chapter and verse, page numbers, etc., on, on many of them. So yes, that's well worth well worth looking at. Okay. Uh, one last question. Um, the person says, I am keen to understand both the way people lived in these houses and also the, their relationship in terms of service and rent to the landowner or chief. Uh, again, uh, the um, general views of the, count, uh, of the ca county agriculture of the various counties, um, and not just Scotland, right across the UK, they gave details of this. So they weren't just talking about the buildings, they were talking about the, um, the form of agriculture practised and, and minerals and, um, and the relationship between tenants and, and um, lairds and relationships with the local mills, really every aspect of agriculture was intended to be covered in these books and often is in great detail. So reading of those, which as I say many of them are available online, um, in Google Books, that sort of thing, um, you, you can find out a lot from those, um, even the levels of rent, you know, the, the prices, that great detail in some cases. Well, thank you for that. That's that's everything. I don't think we've got any more questions just now. Uh, so I think we could we could wrap it up there. So thank you, Neil. Thank you for everybody who attended. Um, keep an eye out for our future events, and we will wish you goodbye. Okay. Thank, thank you. you.